to our March community gathering. I am Ellie Galen. I am president of Humanist Net. Thank you so much for joining us today. Great to see everyone out. Uh, I would like to extend a special welcome to any visitors that we have here today. If you're new to our organization or to humanism itself, uh, here's just a bit of background. Uh, Humanist MN is a secular community for ethical living. We're committed to the well-being of all and sustainability of the planet embracing the concept of human flourishing. We seek to champion secular and moral, civic and political leadership. We are a home for those looking for a community of naturally curious, compassionate, and rational people. Who gather for friendship, personal growth, doing good together, and normalizing the non-religious, naturalist worldview. We're also a very active organization. Um, we organize primarily through Meetup, where you'll see all of our diverse programming, so I recommend checking that out. We are an all-volunteer nonprofit, and we, de uh, we depend on the service and generosity of our members and friends to further our mission. We have many volunteer opportunities, such as the membership team, marketing, programming, and social action. Please reach out to me or Audrey Kingstrom, who you'll be hearing from in a little bit. Uh, we'll be in the lobby afterwards if you're interested in getting involved. And you can also head to our website at humanistsmn.org to learn more about us and explore other opportunities. You can also sign up to become a dues-paying member there if you're not yet. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping. Bathrooms are located downstairs and to the left or out in the hall here and to the left. And after our program, um, around 4.30, there will be a social hour in the lobby, and we would love for you guys to stay and socialize. We will be providing food and drinks, and we encourage you to please consider contributing with a donation to help cover the costs. Up next is Christine Retqua, uh, co-chair of the Humanist in Action team. Thank you. Thank you, Ellie. So good to be here with you all. I am co-chair of the Humanist in Action team with my good friend Marcy, and we had a couple. We have a couple of activities today. One is one half of what we do. We think about community service, and we have many opportunities that we provide. Whether it's cleaning up on a highway, or making fleece blankets for youth in crisis, or bringing in socks and underwear for those who need it, bring it to a food shelf in, up in Anoka County is where it will be going. Um, and so at the table at the front, that is the place to bring anything if you did bring some of those from, the, from seeing the notice. The other half of what social action does is about legislative action. That's kind of the longer term parts of it that makes the rules that we as humanists like in cement them into society. And so we have postcards for causes that are related to um, voting in elections or the environment. So those are things that humanists tend to care about. Contact your legislators and tell them what you think. This is, this is the session for that, the time for that. Don't worry if they kind of know where you sit and they seem to vote that way. They need encouragement still. And if they seem to not tend to agree with you, know that most of our state elections are decided not a 90 to 10% break. It's more like 35 to 40%. So what if that 35 to 40% was more vocal? What if you told them what you think? Tell them what you think. So we have postcards at the front table. Please do come by and sign those. And if you're interested in participating or planning with any actions, please do reach out to me or Marcy, socialaction at humanismn.org. And one thing before I forget, some of you may not know there's parking restrictions in Minneapolis. This side of the street, this building side of the street, you could get ticketed or towed. So I saw about five cars out on this side of the street. So if you're parked on this side, please don't be parked there. And now up next is Mitch, who has some announcements about the nominations, I believe. Hello, I am uh, Mitch Thompson. I'm vice president of the board, and I'm also chairing the nominations committee for board elections. Uh, board elections will take place May 20th at our annual meeting. Um, we're going to be... We're looking for four at-large members. Uh, we will be electing four at-large members, a secretary and a treasurer. Uh, the, <clears throat> if anyone is interested, they should contact myself, Audrey Kingstrom, or uh, Nick 
Uh, it's, and it's in the newsletter how to contact people or come up and talk to me today would be the, probably the best thing. Or, um, so we will have a, um, sorry, I've poorly written notes here. I'm working through this. I didn't know I was going to do this today. Um, so at the, um, at next month's meeting, we will, uh, the nominations committee will bring a uh, slate of candidates to that gathering. At that time, we'll also accept nominations from the floor. And uh, then those members will be voted on and in May at the annual meeting. Um, and that would either be done by, um, it, we would either have a balloted election or it would just be, be done as a slate because we're just accepting that. Mm -hmm that we only have as many candidates as, uh, as there are open spots. Um, and I think that is all I really need to say about that right now. But again, if you have any interest, uh, please come up and talk to me today. Or if you look at our website, there's a way to contact us. And through the newsletter, there was information about contacting people to uh, either nominate yourself or nominate somebody else. Thanks. Oh. And I need to uh, introduce Audrey. Audrey is going to come up and introduce our speaker today. So everyone, here's Audrey Kinstrom. Good afternoon, everyone. So our speaker today is David Breeden, and he is currently the senior minister right here at First Unitarian Society, where we meet. Um, He's taken quite a circuitous route, though, to get here to be minister. He was raised as a Pentecostal in rural southern Illinois, but left his faith in early adulthood. The literary world captured David's attention and imagination, and he went on to study poetry and writing at the Iowa's, Iowa Writers' Workshop, then at the University of Southern Mississippi, where he got his PhD, and also studied at Naropa Institute in Boulder, Colorado. He entered the world of academia and taught English at a small liberal arts college for many years in Texas. Identifying as a humanist and a Taoist, David made a midlife career change and left academia to get a Master of Divinity degree from Meadville Lombard Theological School in Chicago and became a Unitarian Universalist minister, eventually landing right here at First Unitarian. The past 10 years, David has had the opportunity to engage with humanism and humanists at the grassroots level within this humanist congregation and envision and grapple with what the future holds for humanist communities. David is a member of the Institute for American Religious and Philosophical Thought, and he chairs the Education Committee of the American Humanist Association, of which we are a member. He is also a member of our group, Humanist MN, and straddles the worlds of both congregational and secular humanism. Please join me in welcoming our friend and colleague in humanism, David Breeden to our gathering today. Thank you, David. All right. I'll get this sucker going here. I hope. There is no through line, I should quickly say, to the history of humanism because we really don't know what it is. We don't know what religion is either, so you know there's, we, we can argue about those kinds of things. But that's where philosophy and theology and that sort of thing comes in. I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk with you today. We are, I think, at a uh, real turning point in terms of the history of free thought and humanism. And I'm very, very happy that you all are involved. And I'm going to hit my timer so I won't go too long. And I'll kind of speed through some stuff, and then we'll back up um, and uh, ask any questions you have. So, well, first off, I should say, again, with that through line issue, that the Kervakas are probably the oldest of the known pseudo-proto-humanist groups. That's, that's a Hindu group in the uh, 700s before the Common Era that reached a materialist uh, viewpoint that 
Um, God is simply explainable through the, the materialist, naturalist universe. And therefore, why would we bother with such a concept? Because we can see everything we need to see right here. That's why I say there's no through line to humanism, because that pops up, uh, that materialist idea pops up all over the world. It also pops up with Confucius. Confucius simply says, you know, uh, nah, we, we just need to act as if the gods exist. Otherwise, you know, what's, why would you bother? The Buddha said that, you know, we'll talk about that as soon as we solve the s simple human problem of suffering. Uh, and we're not going to solve the human problem of suffering, so uh, we're probably not going to get around to talking about God. Uh, and uh, that also is part of the Epicurean idea. Not that the gods don't exist, but, you know, there's nothing predictable by believing in them, so why do you bother? Uh, they're simply happy beings, at, and they're not going to cross over into our universe. So there you go. Very quick look. If you look in the Oxford Dictionary for what humanism is, first off you're going to see that it's a rationalist outlook or system of thought attaching prime importance to human rather than divine or supernatural matters. That's, uh, you know, uh, doesn't drive you out with, you know, fire in your belly, but that does kind of summarize where we're at. Also, of course, humanism is a complicated word. It also is a Renaissance cultural movement which turned away from medieval scholasticism and revived interest in ancient Greek and Roman thought. And yes, humanities is what some of us study uh, in college. And then among some contemporary writers, and this is very important, especially if you begin to use the word humanist outside of an Anglophone British and American context, and that is that among some, especially European writers, a system of thought crit uh, criticized as being centered on the notion of the rational autonomous self and ignoring the conditioned nature of the individual. In other words, humanists won't get along with anybody and they're selfish beasts. Uh, is the basic idea here. And uh, you do see this, especially in um, writing in continental European philosophy. But you all know Renaissance humanism from the 1500s. It was a break with uh, religious orthodoxy. That's going to stay true all the way down the line. It emphasizes pers personal expression, art, and that kind of thing. That's going to stay true all the way down the line. Assumptions concerning free inquiry and criticism, as opposed to you can't say that, we're going to believe that all the way down the line. A vision of the possibilities of human thought, we still believe that. And seeing human affairs as humanly manageable, as I say, say it almost every week, that human beings can solve human problems. And yes, we still think that today as well. So. The American Humanist Association says humanism is a progressive philosophy of life that, without theism or other supernatural beliefs, affirms our ability and responsibility to lead ethical lives of personal fulfillment that aspire to a greater good. Most humanists will not disagree with that. The only oddity there is this mention of without supernatural. And that's part of what we're going to be looking at today, because is humanism a religion or is it a philosophy? And it has mattered a lot over time, which it is. Yes, I agree, there are better terms. I like free thinker myself. I hate the term humanist because it seems that we're human-centered. Well, we're really not, except insofar as we think we have responsibility. Well, secularist, that also has some problems to it. Naturalist, that has a lot of problems. We're not a nudist colony, I am materialist. So what do we call ourselves? And this has been a problem from the very beginning. Now, I would quickly point out to you that nobody knows how many unbelievers there have been, even in European history. Because no one's going to raise their hand and say, I'm an unbeliever, because that's going to be very bad for your health. But if you look at especially a, a British uh, theologian historian, Alec Ryrie, he has some very interesting things to say about unbelief through time. He says that Protestantism itself 
it is and eats its own system that's always going to burn everything down to zero. So when you start the Protestant bug in Lutheranism uh, in Europe, eventually you're going to end up with humanism because it's just going to keep asking questions until there's nothing left. And I think that is absolutely true. And the question is, how many people have done that through European history and gotten there, but they couldn't say anything? He also has some wonderful things to say in, a, in one of my favorite books by him, Unbelievers, An Emotional History of Doubt, in which uh, he talks about how much it cost people not to believe at one time. The Puritans here in the U.S. were, were so gung-ho for you got to believe, 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 and if they didn't believe, you were damned, right? So suddenly you cross this corner. Well, there were a lot of people who were convinced that absolutely they were damned. So they were believers who were so belief-oriented that they became unbelievers, right, in other words. So it's a very interesting question how many are there. You probably also know that among the atheist community, there are more men than women who do identify as atheists, but the thought is that there are actually more women than men who are atheists, but that because of American socialization, more women don't want to say they're atheists. Well, the history. David Hume, we all know Hume. He's one of our favorites. The idea of God as meaning an infinitely intelligent, wise, and good being arises from reflecting on the operations of our own mind and augmenting without limit those qualities of goodness and wisdom. God is our best self. Guess what? Paul Tillich's going to say that many years later. Um, and it's still, in one way, the only thing you can really say about why anybody would believe in a God is that somehow that's a projection of our best selves. Most people don't know that George L. Eliot, Mary Ann Evans, the novelist you may have been forced to read in high school, etc., but uh, she was also a Unitarian and a free thinker and a translator. And her translations included The Life of Jesus, critically examined, and these are all coming out of German. Now, why was a woman in Victorian England able to translate German? Because women in Victorian England were not allowed to learn classical languages. It would hurt their heads. So they had to learn the contemporary languages. And so you get some very, very strong uh, uh, and very anti-patriarchal uh, statements going on in this time period. So um, Strauss says this biography of Jesus, this is historical myth. It's clearly historical myth, he says, right? This is 1846, he is saying that, and so our novelist brings that into the English language. Another book that she brings into the English language is The Essence of Christianity by Ludwig Feuerbach. This is the absolutely central text in the liberalization of Protestant uh, thinking, and he says it very clearly in the book, and she translates it into English, theology is anthropology. Theology is anthropology. All you're looking at with all your God talk is the human mind. That's what you're talking about. And again, our, our best stre our stretch of ourselves to that best self and what God wants, well, actually, that's what the human mind wants. So theology is anthropology, and, of course, then, anthropology is theology, which also becomes an interesting point. She also translated some of Spinoza's ethics. I don't know about you, but basically Spinoza said it um, exactly what I think all, you know, all these years later. He was, he was just pretty well right about a lot of things. Now, I want to uh, make a very quick uh, side road here. The black freethinker tradition in the U.S., before I get into American history here, um, the black freethinker movement is not exactly like the white one. And we need to be very careful when we talk about free thinking and humanism within the black community because just as in black churches developed differently, so did black free thinking. Uh, the best book I know as a good summary is by Christopher Cameron. 
uh, young academic. Very good book. By the way, I have a short bibliography that you can grab afterward if you like some of the books I mentioned. Frederick Douglass. I can see no reason but the most deceitful one for calling the religion of this land Christianity. I look upon it as the climax of all misnomers, the boldest of all frauds, the grossest, grossest of all libels. Well, how do you feel about that, Mr. Douglas? Right? I think he's pretty clear about how he feels about that. W.E.B. Du Bois on religion is a book by a friend of uh, FUS. He may have spoken it for your group, Phil Zuckerman, uh, who's a contemporary um, secular uh, historian and sociologist. He collects the work by Du Bois on religion in this book. Um, and yeah, Du Bois uh, looked at Unitarianism, he looks at humanism, he looked at ethical culture, and, uh, and also had, at one point was a Baha'i. So he was very much looking for some way to have a religion in America that was not the black church tradition. Zora Neale Hurston, I do not pray. I do not expect God to single me out and grant me advantages over my fellow men. Prayer seems to me a cry of weakness and an attempt to avoid by trickery the rules of the game as laid down. I do not choose to admit weakness. I accept the challenge of responsibility. Sociologist, anthropologist, novelist, etc. Contemporary Morgan Freeman, the highest power is the human mind. That's where God came from, and my belief in God is my belief in myself. That's David Hume right there right, by a contemporary, and Chris Rock, if you're a black Christian, you have a real short memory, <laughs> states it fairly uh, easily there. Some of you know FUS is uh, a friend of Anthony Penn, uh, who was fired from uh, uh, the Twin Cities for, at, when he was a religion professor for becoming an out atheist. Uh, the first place he spoke after he was fired was here. Um, and so he comes back sometimes, uh, and as now, he's a religion professor down in Texas. If you want to look at what uh, black culture and black humanism can be by these hands is a documentary, History of Ameri African American Humanism. Um, it's, very, it's a very strong book that goes all the way back to the beginning of kidnapped Africans being in, the, in this country. Uh, humanism, yes, is on race, religion, and popular culture. That's a collection of essays. And then, of course, his great book that he wrote that talks about how he becomes a humanist is writing God's obituary, how a good Methodist became a better atheist. So, Anthony Penn, uh, and uh, he is the leading voice in uh, humanist, atheist, agnostic uh, theology to this day. Another person who has spoken here is Sakivu Hutchinson. Um, one of her books that you might enjoy is Humanists in the Hood, Unapologetically Black, Feminist, and Heretical. So there's a lot of, 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 of uh, black humanism that doesn't f at first appear in the mainline histories. Now I want to go into, and these books are listed on the bi bibliography, now I want to go into where we come from kind of thing. And the main scholar, uh, he lives in St. Louis, teaches at Washington University, is Lee Eric Schmidt. His most famous book is Restless Souls, The Making of American Spirituality. He begins in the early 1800s and traces how Unitarianism, humanism, free thinking, Develop, and New Age uh, stuff develops during the 19th century around Emerson and Unitarianism and, uh, and that kind of thing. Another book that, takes, that then begins in the uh, mid-19th century that he does is Village Atheists, How America's Unbelievers Made Their Way in a Godly Nation. And the village atheist, the idea there is there's, there's only, there can be only one, right? So we're going to divide and conquer. We're going to call them oddities uh, in our society. Uh, another book that he did that's, uh, that's great fun uh, is uh, Heaven's Bride, The Unprintable Life of Ida C. Craddock, American mystic, scholar, sexologist, martyr, and mad woman. Um, one of the things that becomes uh, uh, devastatingly clear in the late 19th century, and events I'll talk about in a moment, is that 
not only is sex education barred, but also women cannot hear about atheism or free thought. So we have to keep it out of the mail because women may read it. And so this becomes very important. And so you get free love, sex education, uh, and atheism, agnosticism all lumped up into one thing. And so you get people like poor Ida C. Craddock, who spends time in jail for blasphemy uh, for uh, talking essentially about uh, healthy sex. But there you have it. That's part of the story. The most recent book that Lee Eric Smith has done is The Church of St. Thomas Paine, A Religious History of American Secularism. He talks a lot about what I'm, I'm about to talk about next, as a matter of fact. Now, to start with the real trace of humanism to this building here today, we have to really start with Harriet Taylor Mill and John Stuart Mill and the book On Liberty. Um, nowadays, we know that Harriet was uh, at least half the author of the book. Now, the, the interesting thing is that John Stuart Mill never said that she wasn't, right? As a matter of fact, he writes that. Uh, she's a contributing member of, of the writing team here, but being Victorian times, she was not included in it. But she was a feminist uh, and a free thinker at the time, and On Liberty establishes a lot of what uh, liberals think today. And then, of course, Jeremy Bentham. Uh, some of you know that he still attends every faculty meeting at the University of London uh, because his body was embalmed after he died, and that's him in the glass case. Uh, he said, you know, I, I just want to, I love faculty meetings so much, I don't ever want to miss one. So he had himself embalmed, and they do indeed carry him into the uh, faculty lounge every time they have a meeting. Uh, he was an interesting fellow, as, as you might then expect. The principle of utility judges any action to be right by the tendency it appears to have to augment or diminish the happiness of the party whose interests are in question. We all know this as utilitarianism, and it becomes one of the cornerstones of uh, humanist and liberal thinking through time. Now, of course, before we get to the us, here, we have to look at the three horsemen of the, uh, the 19th century uh, going into the 20th, and that would be Darwin and Freud and Karl Marx as being the people who humanists and free thinkers are going to really latch onto as seeing new ways that humanity can be. The missing link in between all of the things I've already been mentioning and us is George Jacob Holyoke, who you probably have not heard of. Uh, he invented the term secular, he was, he was a Brit, and he also spent quite a bit of time in jail for blasphemy. He uh, edited something called The Reasoner, and after coining the term secularism, he says this, free thought means fearless thought. It is not deterred by legal pen penalties nor by spiritual consequences. Dissent from the Bible does not alarm the true investigator who takes truth for authority, not authority for truth. And so there you go. You can see why he's going to get into trouble. And you can see why he's going to lead to us today. And indeed, his magazine covered the uh, uh, jailings for blasphemy during the time period. Remember I said it does become uh, very important whether humanism is a religion or not? It becomes important because you can get arrested for hate speech or for pornography, but can you be arrested at, for practicing your religious belief system? And if not, then you can say, I'm a humanist, you can't arrest me. And that's exactly how Margaret Sanger, for example, the birth control act activist, uh, was banned from speaking uh, by the federal uh, court. And she was only able to speak in Unitarian pulpits because she was speaking in a religious space, not a secular space. So, and that's the way these things can happen. And she indeed spoke at this congregation exactly in that way in the 1920s. So it becomes very important as a, if your speech is protected or not, whether humanism is a religion. 
But we have, and going on in this free thinking, we have such as this, you know, you got the, the country uh, uh, pastor there having a big uh, turkey dinner and the people out on the street starving. And uh, that's exactly how they were seeing things. And so let's come to the U.S. If you are older, like I am, you may have known someone in your past who was a Bob Ingersoll fan. Uh, he at one time was the guy, uh, and uh, a lot of free thinkers in the early 20th century would had all of his books on their shelves. Secularism, he says, is a religion, a religion that is understood. <laughs> It has no mysteries, no mumblings, no priests, no ceremonies, no falsehoods, no miracles, and no persecutions. So there you go. Yes, amen. And, there, and, and so the gospel, according to Bob Ingersoll, uh, becomes quite the thing in the early 20th century uh, among free thinkers. He got away with it because he was a uh, Civil War vet. Uh, had been wounded uh, and was known for the, you know, that this was the time uh, when those guys were being remembered sentimentally. He, uh, however, uh, was uh, unoffered governor of uh, Illinois because uh, he was a free thinker and he would not say that he wasn't. So, another person in the in our line is Felix Adler. 1851 to 1933, who founded the Ethical Culture Movement. It is essentially parallel to uh, humanism, especially Unitarian humanism nowadays, uh, as in that it is congregational, that they, we still do things like, you know, meet and take offerings and that kind of stuff. Uh, it's not secular in the way that humanists of men is, in other words, in most of its incarnations anyway. Uh, it's fast shrinking, unfortunately, as a, uh, as a group. I think that's very, very sad because I, it, it has a, an august history. Felix Adler, uh, his father was a rabbi. Uh, Felix was trained as a rabbi, came back and said, I can have a fine religion, thank you very much, without talking about God. He said, act so as to elicit the best in others and thereby in thyself. That's, that's the essence of ethical culture right there. All right. And free thought of the day, there have been no dirtier wars than religious wars, no bitterer hates than religious hates, no fiendish cruelty like religious cruelty, no baser baseness than religious baseness. So how do you feel about that again, Felix Adler? And at the New York Society for Ethical Culture, uh, some of you know that uh, one of the assistant ministers here, J. Exodus Hooper, is also uh, a leader there, goes back and forth. And so we are still very much connected with the, uh, the ethical culture movement. And then, as I mentioned, the Comstock laws. Now, if you look closely at this photo, if you really want a logo for your group, book burning is probably not the one you would choose. But, uh, but there you go. This kind of says a lot about what the Comstock laws were all about. The Comstock laws wanted to stop pornography in all of its guises, and that included birth control, but it also included women being able to read material about agnosticism and atheism. And so that you, the, this, that you have to realize just how pernicious all of that was. 1873, so the act for the suppression of trade in and circulation of obscene literature and articles of immoral use, this act criminalized any use of the US Postal Service to distribute obscenity, contraceptives, Ab ab abortifacents, yes, I did say it, sex toys, personal letters with any sexual content, yes, they were reading people's letters, or information, or any information regarding the above items. And again, yes, how does spirituality discussions, atheist discussions become part of this? Well, after you get this kind of power that Mr. Comstock had, you, where you can read everybody's letters, uh, you know, this is almost, uh, if not as bad as uh, we saw a little bit later in the 1960s with the FBI. Now, the connecting guy here is Francis Ellingwood Abbott. Fr Francis Ellingwood Abbott was a Unitarian minister, a free thinker. He founded the Liberal League in 1876. The Liberal League was specifically designed to fight the Comstock laws. 
we must get the U.S. postal system free to pass basic information. Guess what? They lost. They lost every battle, right? And the people were going to jail for blasphemy. And the interesting thing about Francis Ellingwood Abbott is that he was utterly convinced that science would prove that God existed. Absolutely convinced of it and never would let, it, let that go at, at all. But notice what he does say. God is as near to you and me as he ever was to Moses, Jesus, or Paul. Guess what? That's transcendentalism. That's Ralph Waldo Emerson, right? Right? Uh, wherever a human soul is born into the love of truth, there is the holy land. Wherever a human soul has uttered its sincere faith in the divine and thus bequeathed to us the legacy of inspired words, there is the holy Bible. And there you go. Um, and so, again, a very Unitarian way of looking at all of this, but the founder of the Liberal League, which the Minnesota chapter, actually the Minneapolis chapter, becomes this congregation is how that works. So if you look it up uh, on in Wikipedia, it does say First Unitarian Society of Minneapolis is a non-theistic humanist uh, community and member of the Unitarian Universal Association, get da 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 and it's uh, the influential minister, John H. Dietrich, who's known as the father of religious humanism, and we are today a, a, the birthplace of congregational humanism as we phrase it nowadays. The history a little bit, again it says in the 1870s the Minneapolis chapter of the National Liberal League began meeting to discuss the ideas of geologist uh, George Lyle and the naturalist Charles Darwin. Upon hearing visiting Unitarian minister Henry Martin Simmons Died in 1905. Lecture, 18 members of the Liberal League voted to become a, UU, a Unitarian church. Now, this is interesting, actually, because they never wanted to be a Unitarian congregation. They wanted this guy who was an expert speaker on Darwin to move to Minneapolis. And he said, I'd be glad to do that, but I happen to be a, a Unitarian minister. He was living in Madison, Wisconsin. He said, uh, uh, so I'll come, but you have to vote to be a Unitarian church. And so they did that. But that's how dedicated they were to, to churchness, if you stop and think about it. Because really, they wanted to be a, a Darwin reading group, not a church. And so we have a very interesting history all the way back, in other words. Um, uh, Barbara Euland, who grew up here uh, in, during those days, uh, later becomes a writer, uh, says that she heard far more about Robert Browning than Jesus in the 1880s and 1890s when she went to church uh, here. So that's part of, of what uh, happened. Now, in 1929, the Society's Women's Alliance formed the American Birth Control League after sponsoring a lecture by Margaret Sanger. As I mentioned, we sponsored her because the, she was literally chased across the bridge from St. Paul. Uh, and the women here took her in and said, sure, you can speak here, right? And so we, we have a very proud history of Planned Parenthood in this congregation. During the Great Depression, uh, we formed the, uh, a group health, uh, uh, and which becomes Health Partners uh, very much later. Also, uh, it, was very, it was a very communist place in the 1930s, shall we say. And Demo Democratic Socialist was about as, as right-wing as, as the people here got, and uh, on over into... Um, uh, a bomb throwing uh, communism with a capital C. So we were kind of all over the place. But uh, the Works Progress Administration plays that, like Waiting for Lefty, if you know labor history, uh, those were what they were performing on the stage at First Unitarian Society in those, in those days. So we were known as Reds back in that day. This particular building opens in 1951. And then us. So and the, one of the oddities is 1881 to now, there haven't been that many ministers because we all really like it here, I think. But uh, John Dietrich and Raymond Bragg are the ones that I do want to talk about a little bit. Uh, but first, John Dietrich is the guy in the glasses. The guy on the left is Curtis Reese. All right, these are the, the twin horsemen of humanism in the Midwest. And they're the reason that we're together today 
because John Dietrich forms this congregation, First Unitarian Society, and Curtis Rees, who was at that time a Unitarian minister when they met, they were German speakers, and I, so I see them you know, getting together. They grew up in German-speaking homes. I, I think they probably had a few too many beers and came up with the term humanism uh, because Curtis Rees wanted to call it the religion of democracy. But, uh, which I think might have been better in some ways. But anyway, so Curtis Reese becomes the first president of the American Humanist Association. Uh, he just wasn't into ministry as much as uh, Dietrich was. Uh, so these two guys, uh, buddies, um, Curtis Reese was in Des Moines, Iowa as a Unitarian minister. Both of them had been kicked out of their more traditional Protestant uh, traditions and had become Unitarians, and that wasn't radical enough for them, so they want now to become humanists. And so they invented this term together. Uh, they got it from that Holyoke guy that I showed you. Uh, they were reading stuff uh, from England uh, in order to come up with that particular title. Now, their great big uh, uh, inspiration is John Dewey and prag the pragmatism of the early 20th century. Dewey is real forthright about it. There is no God and there is no soul. Hence, there is no need for the props of traditional religion. With dogma and creed excluded, then immutable truth is dead and buried. There is no room for fixed and natural law or permanent moral absolutes. Well, that's kind of what a lot of us believe today, isn't it? And you can see how that's going to formulate into the early humanism that's going to become the first humanist manifesto of 1933, which was written by uh, Raymond Bragg, uh, who was one of the ministers here, and, and signed by him and also the senior minister at that time, uh, John Dietrich, whose Dietrich room is in there. So they signed this, and it says, first, religious humanists regard the universe as, as self-existing and not created. Well, that's going to not go over well with the Bible set, I think. Humanism believes that man is a part of nature and that he has emerged as a result of a continuous process. You know, natural selection, uh, that's not going to fly in Peoria. Holding an organic view of life, humanists find that the traditional dualism of mind and body must be rejected. There is no soul, people, <laughs> right? <laughs> Fundamentalism is, 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 you know, they're not going to like that. And fourth, and there are 13 of these. Yeah, fourth, humanism recognizes that man's religious culture and civilization, as clearly depicted by anthropology and history, are the product of a gradual development due to his interaction with his natural environment and his social heritage. The individual born into a particular culture is largely molded by that culture. Interesting, and certainly not the ideas of the time. Uh, one of our archive group, we have an archive I'll mention in a bit, if I have time, uh, dug around. This is uh, from 1919. Uh, this is... Uh, uh, John Dietrich, The Twilight of the Gods and the Religion of the Dawn. Yes, humanism, in his estimation, was the religion of the dawn. Curtis Rees, as I mentioned, goes, uh, who died in 1961. As, you know, all Unitarians should, he died in a, in a board meeting, right? So, you know, that, that's heaven for Unitarians, right? Uh, a board meeting at Meadville Lombard, as a matter of fact, right? Uh, but he was the secretary of the Western Conference, and, the, and they're the ones that go off the rail and all become humanists out here in the Midwest. And we, we do well to remember that humanism uh, from this early time is a Midwestern invention, all right? Then it says here, um, uh, this is uh, from the website American Humanist Association, you can look this up yourself, but that uh, 1933, the Humanist Manifesto, very much a John Dewey and Lester Mondale, now that comes back to, to bite Minnesotans later, right? Lester Mondale is tied in with uh, his, 
his cousin, uh, who is then called a godless communist uh, by his uh, uh, opponents. And uh, so, yes, humanism plays even in American political context, right? And then it says in this middle paragraph, the American Humanist Association was formed in 1941 when Curtis W. Reese and John H. Dietrich, two well-known Unitarian ministers and humanists, organized the uh, Humanist Press Association of Chicago and to the American Humanist Association. And so, yes, those are the two guys who essentially create what we do today in both of our contexts. Now, the other thing that I need to mention is, and let's see how much of my, oh, I've got all right, a little time left, is the idea of secular humanism. The term when Dietrich and Curtis Reese were alive was religious humanism. I now call that congregational humanism because I insist that there's no difference between secular humanism in terms of belief systems. It's, it's that some humanists want to congregate in a way that looks sort of like Protestantism, and some don't. That's the difference as far as I'm concerned. It's the only difference as far as I'm concerned. Secular humanism was invented by um, the uh, a Supreme Court decision that uh, was in our favor uh, about a religious organization, but the term was invented accidentally in the court decision. Uh, and this was in 1965. And then, guess what? People who didn't like the decision begin to read it and they start seeing this term secular humanism. It didn't exist. Except that as a concept, it sort of did already, didn't it? It was those humanists who no longer wanted to be in congregations. They, they were secularizing people. That still today is a very fast growing group of people. Did they have human rights? Could they be American citizens? Well, you know, that's when the right-wing ministers, Jimmy Swaggart, et cetera, start coming along, is after that to condemn us as secular humanists. Now, what they were saying is we're a religion. Well, are we? Well, the problem was we, some of us claimed that back in the day in order to get religious exemptions like free speech and not being locked in prison. So um, are we? And if, if we are, are, is the secularization of America that we do see around us, the growth of the nuns, the, the growth of the duns and all of that, is that the result of our ideas or is it just happening around us? Which is a good, I think, a valid question that we continue need to ask, as a matter of fact. So, it becomes a cudgel by the right wing to attack us as this dark conspiracy. Well, all of us know how many humanists there really are in the world, right? I mean, uh, we've never been a threat to anybody, basically, right? But we certainly were seen as such. If you turn left down the hall, Right before the restrooms, you'll see the Heritage Room. We have here at First Unitarian Society a rich treasure trove of historical items uh, that probably, well, some of them don't exist anywhere else. Some of them exist here in Harvard because they did keep uh, the, uh, a lot of the archives from the uh, Unitarian Association when it, when it closed down its, its old office. So we have a lot of stuff. Uh, that uh, is very rare, and if you'd like to look into sort of the smoking gun of, you know, how does this word humanism get pulled into the context that they're talking about here, um, and how does it become this larger thing, and um, why doesn't anyone know the history of much of what I just told you? So, so there you are. Well, good. I have some time to answer some questions for you. Um, so do we want to, how do we want to go about doing that? Well, people can come up, uh, up front here and sort of take, uh, get in line. Should I move this over here further? Um, and I should move, pull it up, Bob says. Okay. So uh, if you have a question, uh, please uh, come up here and uh, keep your sh questions short. <laughs> <laughs>
without too much commentary. Right. <laughs> Otherwise, I will come and bump you out of the way. All right, so we have time for more yeah. questions. Yeah. All right. So yeah. uh, we'll start here. And, and so say your name for the at-home audience, which there may be. I'm Jerry Smith. Um, I have a question about this issue of is humanism a religion? And um, to preface it, um, let me say, for me, the best definition of religion I've seen comes from Philip Kitcher, a philosopher, mm -hmm. who highlighted the belief in some transcendent or supernatural reality as the hallmark of religion. Mm -hmm. If it's not a belief in a divine being, a supreme being, it's a belief in an afterlife, in some sort of transcendent experiences. Mm -hmm. Humanism is naturalistic, and yep. so it doesn't encompass beliefs in transcendence. Right. And so on Kitcher's definition, humanism is not a religion. Right. And so my question is, get to a question here, do you have a better definition of, of religion in which humanism would be a religion, if so, I'd like to hear it because I'm very skeptical that there is a better definition of religion on which humanism would, be, would count as a religion. Okay, yes. Religion is the study of the human in rea relation to reality itself. How is that? How is that? I mean, that's science. That's, that encompasses science is that. It, it's also Roman Catholicism, though. Uh, Roman Catholicism could say that, but they bring in all sorts of supernatural stuff that has yeah. no grounds in any kind of serious study. What I'm saying is that religion, I, I don't want to let them get away with saying that, it, that there has to be a supernatural element. I mean, if, if, if condemning religion is the, uh, you know, is the only aim, that, you know, I mean, that, that's all good. But, I mean, I don't, uh, Westerners... It, you know, as we colonized, we invented, we said, you know, hey, Buddhists, that's a religion. Hey, Hindus, that's a religion. So we invented the concept of religion as Westerners, right, uh, in, in that context. And that's one of the interesting things as we dig back through time. Um, that's why I, I find Taoism very uh, interesting. I find the Kyoto School uh, at, just before and after the Second World War uh, because they were reading uh, transcendentalism and American philosophy, and they were Buddha, you know, Japanese Buddhists, and putting you know those things together uh, in order to get that. But I mean, the the other thing about it is, you know, I mean, I, and I always, you know, yes, I can I can prove that tr prove to you that God exists if I get to define God. <laughs> yeah, and you can right. prove to me that humanism right. is a religion if you get to define religion. Well, but, right, but you've right, got to have, right. You, I mean, you have to have, are you, to prove that God exists, you're going to have to have some evidence and some good reasons. It's not just whatever. And to say that religion is whatever, you've got to have good grounds for that, too. Mm -hmm. I'd have quarrels with that, that definition yeah. of religion. Well, well what you say is that, that God is completely coterminous with, with observable reality. So why do we need it? The concept. Of That's that. what I say, <laughs> but I, but I don't deny that you can, you can have a god like that because you know that that simple pantheism basically it's according to whether or not it all it all adds up to more than one, which I don't think it does. But, but that's the real question. I mean, that's uh, Whitehead's theology as well, that process theology. Does everything do, does does every computer on the internet add up to more than the internet? I don't think it does. It seems wondrous, but, but it still isn't, right? It's just, it's just electronics, Thank you. right? But anyway, yeah. So yeah, no, these definitions are, yeah. <laughs> They're slippery. Yes. Hi, David. Hi. This, uh, my name is Marcy. Thank you so much for being here, or for being mm -hmm. where you're supposed to be, <laughs> right? Um, I'm gonna try to articulate this as best yeah. I can. Mm -hmm. I have a question about interfaith. Yep. Um, I believe that FUS is partners frequently with other progressive or with progressive religious groups, mm -hmm. and, um, which I think is great. And I'm wondering um, if you have any struggles with that. Do any, I mean, you're really not faith-based, but how do you make, uh, build those relationships? Because yeah. values-wise, other than the religious part, there's probably a lot of similar values. And what struggles or what right. challenges do you have? Um, I'm, right. 
with my sweet partner, Christine. I am the second half co-chair of the Humanist in Action team, and that's something we struggle with a mm -hmm. little bit, is trying to, um, how do we partner with groups, since we don't have a faith, but we share the same, yeah. a lot of the same values. And as FUS, how do you, um, how do you navigate that? Yeah, that's a good, well, it's a very good question. Uh, I would also mention quickly that what, one of the interesting things is, is the leader aspect of it. Um, the Hindus in town don't have representation uh, on any of the ministers' groups. Um, the Baha'is don't, uh, Quakers don't, and, and those are all groups that are traditionally religious, but they're not, they don't have uh, paid leadership usually. And so that's one of the things that's going on is that there's a prejudice against those who don't have paid leadership. And since I'm paid leadership, you know, I, I get invited, right? But we do know that Audrey was able to, uh, to do the invocation, you know. And so there's a little more openness to secularity. But I do sometimes nicely say to my ministers, friends, when we're doing, talking about this stuff, that, you know, as the bridge between, we call ourselves the bridge between the religious and, uh, and the secular world, First Unitarian, um, actually, I'm sp speaking for more people than any of them, if you want to put it that way, right? Because most people do not darken any church doors or any temple doors or, right? So... Secularity is, is totally politically important, but we don't have the representation still that, that does that. But, you know, um, I think that's probably why this, the, the ministers in this congregation have stayed in Unitarian Universalism, which we really, I don't think anyone has ever liked very much, to be real honest with you, because it's, it's just a little wishy-washy, and it's just not... It, it's not fulfilling. I've always been a humanist, you know, myself. I just, uh, the Unitarian Universalist groups I went to were all lay-led, and, and therefore they were all humanist, right? Right, so, and that's how I got to where I am. But humanism is, is, what, I, is what I think, right? And, and yes, the, 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 the religion aspect, but Again, how do we define religion? And I, I get it that we, we don't get to accept that. Um, what are we doing that they, you know, don't do? And what, are, you know, I mean, what is it? Is it a frame of mind? Is it, the, is it a way of seeing reality that informs everything, all of your actions? I, I think so, it's which, you know, encompasses philosophy and religion. So... Secularism is in that way, and and deserves to be at the table when we're talking about, um, you know, education in the city of Minneapolis, right? So, yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah, I know it's frustrating though. It's very frustrating. Thank you for groups. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much, David. Um, my name is Suzanne Perry. Um, I'm one of those people who is a big fan of Robert Ingersoll, who you talked about. Yay! Yeah, and um, I'm struck when I read about him at how popular yeah. his speeches were, despite the fact that he was condemning religion in very stark terms. Uh, he went around the country speaking at huge audiences. Um, so I guess my question is, where's our Robert Ingersoll today? <laughs> how, how do we communicate yeah, yeah. our values um, in, a, in a way that reaches reaches the public. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah, for example, you know, they, there was uh, someone asking him a question about, you know, why should agnostics be allowed to adopt children uh, because, you know, they're not godly. And he said, well, you know, um, remember the flood? God killed all his children. <laughs> you, know, so, you know, so he's not a real good parent, uh, you know. Uh, so, you know, I mean, he, was the, he, he would do that kind of stuff and he would, he would make fun of the Bible and stuff. But then he would switch. You know, and he would say, my religion is to do good, right? Yeah. Uh, and I'm a citizen of the world and this sort of Tom Paine stuff. And so it, it, he would switch it into a positive message, right? And, and a fairly progressivist political message as well. So, you know, we, that's what we need. We don't need another Dawkins who is, is just making fun of the religious. 
which is, you know, the last thing we need, I think, you know, it just, it, it doesn't work. We, we know it doesn't work. It's, it, it, you know, it, it's momentarily funny, but it doesn't work, you know. Yeah, well, well, that's a sort of related question because Dawkins and a few other, Christopher Hitchens and a couple other guys were really hot maybe yeah. 10 or so years ago. Yeah. Um, but they haven't really been replaced no. in terms of people who, who are reaching out to the general public, so. <laughs> yeah, well, and you know, the pro you know, part of the problem is that it, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. I mean, uh, when moderate people say moderate things, that doesn't make the news. If I, you know, if I say that God is going to uh, uh, destroy New Orleans because of the gay people, you know, and here comes a hurricane, you know, but, uh, but saying something positive about loving your neighbor, I mean, that's, that just doesn't get on the news. I mean, you know, it's sad, but, you know, I mean, uh, as I say, I mean, far more people don't murder anyone in the day in any given, <laughs> thankfully, I mean, you know, uh, yeah. yes. Christine Radquah, thank you very much, David. I thank appreciate you. your his, you. history thank and you. the bibliography, because I'm going I'm to get yeah. that. Um, I hope we can come up with somebody who is a leader to help, because as you say, there's a lot of folks out here, I think, yeah. who identify with this. When we go and table at festivals and such, people say, wait, I might be a humanist. Mm -hmm. They're out there. They um, my point kind of goes back to a different variant on what Marcy was asking about. We recognize, many organizers and activists recognize, when you are a mass, you have more impact. Yep. And so part of it is, who do we align with? Mm -hmm. And what do you think you or others who have that role at FUS, how do you decide that? Because there are some groups, and we looked at some things, and you know they're really very Christian. I don't know if we want to, you know, yeah, know, jump on that ship. So, mm -hmm. what what is the process? How is some of that decision making made? Thank you. Well, yeah, thank you. Yes, that that's a very difficult question. Uh, for example, I'm working with uh, uh, the downtown senior clergy. We're doing a series. We went to the south uh, for a civil rights tour and we did videos and all this stuff. And we could all do that, right? We could all do that. Even though, you know, I could start pointing fingers, you know, and say, well, yeah, you Roman Catholics, you know, that, you know, uh, because actually Unitarians were sort of on the right side of history during the civil rights era. And that's a, that's a cool thing. But it, but it also was a, a long time ago, shall we say. So we're, you know, it's not a one and done sort of sort of deal as part of the problem. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's just really hard uh, to, to who goes along with our values. We took money up uh, here at, at FUS for uh, victims of the tornado in some Alabama. Um, <laughs> the main group in some Alabama that is doing good on the ground for the people who are chopping the trees down to get them off the wires is uh, Jehovah's Witness. So do I send them, uh, you know, that's, that's always going to be the problem, right? There's only about two churches in town, and there's, there ain't no Unitarian one, there, there ain't no humanist. So, um, you know, what do you do, right? And, and my choice is to make, make de decisions one by one. Roman Catholic, Catholicism and I will never meet except on the, on the question of homelessness, which is, they have a lot of resources to throw that way, right? So what am I gonna do? You know, you know FUS is, is an institution, but we don't have deep pockets. But you look at uh, Plymouth Congregational, you look at Westminster, you look at Temple Israel, they have deep pockets. They have a lot of resources. And if we can direct those, then we're, we're we are operatively doing good, right? So that's, that's yeah, yeah, please. Well, I have a question and then kind of a build on to it. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious why this organization is sort of in a church setting. Like it yeah. feels very much like the pulpit and pews feels like a church to me, yep. even though technically 
Mm -hmm. what y'all are talking about isn't church, right? So mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. my first question. Yep. And then the build on to that is how much do you think humanists really tackle systemic oppressions? Like you can, yep. you know, help with the Selma, Alabama issue or things like that, right. but how much, especially yep. if one is comfortable yeah. meeting or gathering in a church-like setting, how much are you really tackling systemic oppressions and other issues yeah. of that nature? Yeah, no, very good question. And, and it, it, it haunts traditional humanism uh, to have been a, uh, a classically white privileged space, right? And as, it, and as I say, even though the W.B. Du Bois people would come in, you know, they were invited in and they didn't stay. Right. It was it, so. It stayed very much a privileged, educated white thing, um, and we try to work against that now. But it doesn't always work very well. Uh, you, those of you who keep up with the American Humanist Association know that the uh, the um, executive director just uh, left. A woman of color friend of this congregation, we loved her a lot. Why, it, why did she go? Systemic racism is the, is the first answer that I would say, you know. Uh, I, don't, I don't know the whole story. I know all the people, unfortunately, so it's very, you know, so I'm not saying anything, basically, because I just know everybody, and uh, I know they're all working hard. But I also know that one of the things about white spaces, white liberal spaces, is that we all want black faces, but we don't want black minds. And you need to think about that very deeply, white people, right? We want black faces, but we don't want black minds. And uh, I can see that happening in a lot of liberal spaces that have rushed to, to, to hire people of color and then say, oh my God, what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> Right, well, you know that, and that's part of the that's part of the challenge that we have to face going forward. Yeah, go, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. So my follow-up question then is: as people leave because of systemic racism and bias that we're navigating constantly, isn't that the opportunity then to step in and then start to tackle it each time? I mean, it's a reactive way to go about it, which is yep. an ideal, but then at least you have that door open. That person has left because they can't survive in what we have to navigate every day, doing what we have to do every day. So why not then, when the door is open, sadly because they're leaving, do we not rush in and say, what are these systemic things that we're continuing to you know, perpetuate? You know, why do we have a support Ukraine, stand with Ukraine poster, but not a stand with Congo poster? Like, what's there the difference, you, you know? There you go. And mm -hmm. so I think maybe mm -hmm. we have more opportunities more and more to tackle it, but we need people to step in when that door is open to maybe keep it open so that then more people come back in and then they come into a space that is more um, woke. Right. Well, well, absolutely. I mean, one of the interesting things that you're going to hear people say, you know, why, why aren't there more people of color in liberal especially religious humanist spaces, well, <laughs> because the, no one looks like you when you walk in, and how, how inviting is that, right? And so only those people who have learned to navigate and put up with white space ever stick around, right? So that, that's, that's the challenge. But, but at what we can do... At what cost, though? Well, well, yeah. Well, I mean, what it means is that... Um, if we believe what we say, and, and I, I do, human reality and the human mind interacting with that reality, as it said in that manifesto, that, that is the great interest of, of humanity. If we only say the European white people had the good ideas, what are we doing? How stupid is that, right? Right, and if we only say you you have to do it like we like this white group has always done this board meeting, how stupid is that, right? And, and how much are you 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 simply destroying your own humanity, right? Which that you know that you know this mutuality idea. I mean, 
everyone who's thought it through, I think, through human history has expressed that, that we've got to listen to the other people. That's, that's the only, the human conversation is all we got and all we're ever going to have. And certainty is the great enemy. It kills us, and we kill others when we get certain. So we've got to listen to all the voices. Yeah, you know, and, 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 that, and if, if anything good comes out of the present situation at the American Humanist Association, that's the message I'm trying to communicate. But, there, yeah, please, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I hear what you're saying, and I don't know if it's just about listening to other people. How then do you integrate other people's ideas into that white space, right? Mm -hmm. How mm -hmm. do you, you know, I navigate this every day of my life in most situations I'm in. I can have a great idea, but it's just not as received as well, you know, right. as somebody else presenting it. So. Mm -hmm. It's not just the listening, it's the integration. How do you integrate other people who don't look like you's ideas into the normative white space? I think that's a question we need to have like a forum on because that's part of the problem. Like even, you know, progressive liberals, I think there's some block that doesn't see people who aren't like them sometimes. I'm not saying all people mm -hmm. all the time, mm -hmm. but I don't know, there's something in the air in the water that just doesn't it's not normative for someone who doesn't look like you to actually be a change maker. So if that is the issue, how do we tackle, how do we have that conversation? Right. <laughs> exactly. And well, well, you know, yeah. So, so <laughs> tomorrow uh, at Westminster, we're going, <laughs> uh, we're going to uh, have the second of the things that I was talking about uh, and uh, with the uh, other ministers. And that's exactly what they 4 p.m., yes, and, and that's what the, they recorded me talking about. What we did on this, we had 11 of us, and three were African-American men ministers. And we're very much a, a group that talks about stuff, so we trust each other. There weren't any black women involved, unfortunately, but three uh, black men went, went with us. And so when we started talking on the van about uh, historically black colleges, and, and uh, uh, restitution. Um, the white people stopped talking at some point. Now, ministers always think they know everything. <laughs> in case you haven't met any ministers, let me fill you in on that. Uh, and so they, they, you know, we ministers think that we, we are the most excellent speakers and thinkers ever invented. You know, so we have an opinion on every topic. But we were also smart enough to shut up when black men were talking about being black men in American culture, right? What that means. And, and uh, one of the things we have to do in organizations is shut up, right? Especially old white guys like me. And the, the reason is that I was trained to speak up and to sound like I knew what the hell I was talking about. Right? And so I go around fronting that I know what I'm talking about. That's, that's what, you know, that's my coping mechanism. It is for a lot of white guys, right? That's why we, we mansplain, right? It's, it's because we've been taught to do that. Uh, and we have, to, we have to learn not to do that. Audrey, do you want to say something? <laughs> <laughs> Well, people know me. I always have a lot to say. But um, so thank you. You didn't introduce yourself, yeah. um, last speaker, and I look no. forward to having more conversation with you. I, and I appreciate that you showed up today in this very white space. Mm -hmm. um, I guess one of the things that um, you promised to talk a little bit more about, and I, I want to press you on this, um, and that is the future of humanism. Um, and I think that circles around mm -hmm. to, because... Um, to what was just being talked about. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tie it in with religion. Um, those people who know me, and for those of you who don't, I am a member at First Unitarian Society, as well as being extremely involved with Humanist MN. And I, too, straddle both of those worlds, mostly in the secular humanist world, but came here because it has... It has institutional structure and history, and it was a place for my family 
and secular humanists were not organized enough to have that when I needed that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I agree. I don't like the term religion, except from a soci I'm a student of sociology. I do have another definition of religion. It is, religion is, um, a, I don't know what I'm going to call it, a system where you talk about what you do believe, values, what's ultimately most important in life. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a construct, a human construct, so people develop mm -hmm. systems, and so that's what we call like, anyway, anyway so all the, the traditional religions, but Confucianism and, and other ways of thought, you can, it's a, it's a way, lifestyle, a worldview. But I try to, anyway, be, because most people have the definition that Jerry just gave us, yeah. I don't like to use that word. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I always say that we are at a transition time in history. I suppose we all always are at a transition time. But especially as the world is becoming more secular and America is becoming more secular. Where we, I, maybe it's not true that we don't still need community. We still need a place where we can talk about what is most important in life and our values, and a way to promote that. I think humanism, what, even if it's not the best term, needs to be institutionalized. Mm -hmm. I don't know that you yeah. you is Unitarianism yeah. is the name of the future. I think humanism is a better name for the future, and maybe there will be a better one, but we're on our way. Where are we, where are we going, and how do we get there? Is, right. is there a place for this movement and how, and how do we move forward being inclusive mm -hmm. and, and a place, a transition between people who understand themselves as maybe religious to not religious, right. secular, whatever. This right. middle space, what is it going to look like? How do we get there? Right. Well, number one, I always say, and, and you mentioned that, that congregations and groups are aggregators. Right? We are able to aggregate energy, money, time, and then point them toward things. Right? That, that's what we do. And we do that in social justice. We do that uh, when someone breaks their leg skiing and they need, you know, a, they need a meal train or a ride. So that, that's what we do. Now, you know, the congregational side of it, we take that even more seriously, right? We, um, we will take care of you, basically, is, 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 our, uh, is our contract with people. And the great insight of uh, John Dietrich all those years ago was that you could do what he saw as the best of religion, which is the congregating, taking care of each other, aggregating, without the God part, without forcing people to believe anything. And as a matter of fact, when his first sermon, he promises, I will, I will never tell you what to believe. I, I will only offer uh, options. And that, that's what he did. And that's what I try to do. I, as humanists, I don't think, there, there aren't that many things I can absolutely say, you must believe this. Um, even the Humanist Manifesto, the first one was too lock-stepped and, and Moses scripture for a lot of people. You know, no, I can't agree just because, you know, it's concretely written down, you know, and we can't have that, you know, kind of, kind of thing. Now, where, where are we going? I don't know. What I do know is that the, the past that I was talking about, they were all strong individuals. The institutionalists among them had very large personalities, like Felix Adler, and they didn't agree with anybody else. So they built small institutions. And if you start looking at secular institutions today, how many of them are there? You know, uh, dozens. And they're all tiny, but there are dozens. Now, that was because no one could cooperate with anybody. And they were, you know, and they were institution builders. 
I think boomers were good at keeping the institutions that their parents handed down, were fairly good at keeping those up. That's what we boomers did as we respected what our parents did. And we, we kept buildings like this open. But we never had any vision for what next. We were just keeping the buildings open, I, I would argue. That was, that, that's the problem with my generation, is we were merely sustainers of institutions. And I think younger people say, well, what the hell? What, why, what is this for? Why are you doing this? Why are you spending all this time and effort sustaining these institutions? Um, why don't you do something? Right? Why don't you spend that money that you spent on the, you know, on the, uh, you know, the big uh, potluck? Why didn't you spend that for homeless people? You know, why didn't you invite some, some homeless people? You know, why don't, why didn't you go to the north side, to help out? And and so I, you know, I think those are very valid questions, right? Um, when people ask me about, you know, the Unitarian. Which is very august. I mean, if you go down to uh, the park over here, you know, one of the apartment buildings now is a maternity hospital, right, that was opened by Unitarians and Universalists here in town for unwed mothers. That's really good work, right? But you know what? They didn't allow their daughters to go over there because it might rub off, right? You know, their, their sinful, low-class ways might rub off. So we've had, a, we've had a class problem. We've had a race problem. You know, we've had an education problem. And these are things we just have to name. Dietrich was a democratic socialist. He believed that all classes should be in the room together. But it didn't happen didn't happen, or it didn't sustain, I should say. It, it, here it lasted through the 50s, basically, that there were a lot of working class union type people here. But that about, and, and there were, uh, in the Martin Luther King era, there were a lot of people of color here. But again, that, that you have to be white, right? You have to think white if you want to be among us was part of the problem at that time. So, so what do we do? We, we, you know, we wake up to the fact that America is a multicultural, multi-religious place. We stop making fun of the religious just because they're religious, you know, and we get out there and we do the work because that's what people need. We, human beings can solve human problems. We created climate change. Yeah, we were really stupid and we probably, we didn't understand all the implications, but we created it. Get to work, you know. We created the education gap. Get to work, right? You know. We did some pretty good legislation this past week here. So let's get to work. So, yeah. Tell me when to stop. <laughs> well, well, uh, oh. All right. Well, let, we, let Christine no, have last question, word. But it's occurring to me that it's kind of touch on what we've talked about. We come together. We come together to do what we can to make change with whoever we are aligning with. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, yep. it, as you say, people are more individualistic. We, I see that in a number of volunteer organizations I've been with over time. People's lives are just different. You weren't associated with one thing, and everybody was associated with that one thing. We all have different preferences and interests. Align when you can. Stay in touch with whatever your passion is and join up and form, form a force for good That's right. on whatever that thing is for you. Yep. And, and, and do what we can, because it, it's, it's not going to be clear. We may not have the big one leader, but we're tr I think what we're trying to do through Humanist MN is provide opportunities. Yep. Um, what, what, what aligns for you, please join, and, and know that taking action matters. Yep. So that, that's, that's what I can offer. There you go. Well, no, I mean, I, I actually think that the day of the powerful leader up front is well over, actually. Right? I mean, uh, uh, remember, that maybe, but some of you know that the FBI wiped out the Black Panthers of Chicago, the, the biggest black organization in Chicago, in one night, because they knew who, who the leaders were and they shot them, arrested them, 
wiped, wiped out the organization. That's what you can do if you've got one head, right? And so I think, uh, I think the fact that leaders are much more spread out now is actually a good thing. But, yeah. Well, that really is a good thought, just to add to the conversation here, is I do believe in institutions as a student of history and a student of sociology. But I am not a big, even though it'd be nice to have a popular humanist speaker that just could just galvanize us, that is really a bad model. And um, of, you know, the often very egotistical, authoritarian types that ends up being However, I believe in institutions, and so that is about, um, and, and as a student of history, change, we need leaders, but change happens mostly through the grassroots. The people organize, struggle, fight for change, and, what the, and that's how it's happened through history. Not that we haven't had help from leaders, but we usually have to make them do it. Anyway, that said, <laughs> um, Christine had good words for us. Um, let's join in. But, but I do think we do need to have more of us, and we need to be more visible. So anyway, a good point to... Get out there um, and t tell them who you are. Exactly. Be uh, a humanist at work day. Yes, yes. Um, thank you all for being here this afternoon. And... Um, I'm thinking, and if people have other ideas, I'm just thinking that we should probably have more forum kinds of programs where we're having multiple voices um, think through some issues. But anyway, I welcome people's ideas as someone who helps plan programming <laughs> for Humanist MN. Anyway, thank you for being here. Please stay for more conversation. David, can you stay around yep. for a little while? Yep. Yeah, so David, um, we have beverages and if drinks. I can have a free beer. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, uh, yes. So um, do stay. Um, check out the table um, where the Humanists in Action table over to your right um, as, as you came in. And that's where David's uh, bibliography there. There's some uh, sheets there if you're interested in his bibliography. Thanks again. We'll be back here next month. See you then. <laughs>